I am a child of my times. I have been profoundly influenced and shaped by the time period in which I have lived. Each of us, in our own individual way, are part of a much larger societal structure. Although it is very human to think of ourselves as completely unique, in reality, few of us are raised in a vacuum, untouched by the course of human history. I am a baby boomer. A baby boomer is a descriptive term for Americans born between 1946 and 1964. <clears throat> this image encapsulates the euphoria that many Americans felt as World War II came to an end for us, I have to say, on August 14, 1945, and 12 million American servicemen and servicewomen returned home to resume their lives as civilians. Some would be reunited with spouses and children, others to fiancés, boyfriends, or girlfriends. Many had met someone special during their service activities. These relationships were fueled by common traditional values. They ultimately led to marriage and family production, which secured the American way of life with its dreams of prosperity during a very hopeful time. It's a very famous photograph. A post-war euphoria would create a generation of almost 76 million boys and girls, one baby every eight hour, eight seconds for 18 years. The 1950s and 1960s were years of exceptional economic growth in the US, fueled in great measure by the emergence of the post-war baby boom and the subsequent growth of new markets to serve a child-centered nation. My parents were married in 1946. They met at a Saturday night dance in Brooklyn, New York during the war years. I was born in 1948. Baby boomers, as we're called, were children of a new emerging middle class and came of age during the late 1950s and 60s when racial segregation was legal, interracial marriages were taboo, and blacks and other minorities were marginalized and living on the fringes of American society. Women suffered the same fate as minorities and were victims of discrimination routinely stereotyped in the job market and sharply limited in their opportunities for higher education. Baby boomers, my generation was angered by what they perceived as senseless injustices and unfair treatment to minorities. They rejected their parents' conservative and consumer-driven lives by challenging societal norms towards sex, drugs, music, politics, and the acquisition of wealth. Boomers were social cause oriented by embracing multiculturalism and diversity. They prote protested for equal white rights for women. The women's movement of the 1960s made significant changes for women in regards to their basic rights within the home and in the workplace. Boomers protested for civil rights I am a man is a declaration of civil rights often used as a personal statement and as a declaration of independence against oppression. These photos were taken in 1968. And my generation protested to bring attention to the practice of social, of racial, gender, and age discrimination in the workplace and to end police brutality, which didn't really happen, but there it is. We actively protested against the tyranny and injustice of a war where thousands of American young men 
were routinely and unfairly drafted into military service, many against their will. The poster on the left shows a young man burning his draft card. That's um, a piece of identification that was issued to all young men in the US. It's a call to military service. And, and, and so they would burn this call to military service in their protest of, of, of the war in Vietnam. OK, so back to silly. During the tur this turbulent time, my family lived in Queens, which is a suburb of New York City. I was 15 years old in the fall of 1963 when I entered the High School of Art and Design. Art and Design is one of a select group of New York City specialty high schools where applicants must take an entrance exam and present a portfolio to be accepted. This is a publicity photograph taken with my father, Cy Resnick, on the occasion of my winning a radio competition, and this particular radio was WMCA Good Guys. That was the name of the, of the station. You know, they played all the latest pop hits. And they held a sweatshirt competition. So I added yarn braids onto the radio station's smiley face logo, turning the MCA Good Guys logo into a girl. So that's probably my early most feminist statement. I studied fashion illustration and advertising design along with a full course load of academic subjects required to earn my high school diploma. Unfortunately, most of the work I did as a teenager was lost, but the ink drawings I made for the French American uh, newspaper survived in my scrapbook. Also, this fashion illustration I drew from a photograph. In the 1960s, there was a dress code for young women. We wore dresses or skirts, silk stockings, and small heeled shoes to school. No pants. Fashion dictated that we wore lots of heavy eye makeup and styled our hair into towering bouffant hairdos. For the photo on the right, I was posing for a photography student in my, it's, I know it's black and white, hot pink hip hip hugger pants outfit with white go-go boots. Early in 1964, the Beatles arrived in New York, bringing with them a wave of British contemporary styles like mini skirts, the go-go boots you saw me wearing, and the hip hugger pants, and long straight hairstyles. The 1960s were truly synonymous with a new, exciting, radical, and subversive events, and I lived in the epicenter. Although I was accepted at New York City's Pratt Institute, I knew it would be best for me to attend an art college away from my New York City-based family. I decided to accept a placement at the Rhode Island School of Design. In 1966, RISD was a very small art college in very rural Providence, Rhode Island. Here we dressed very informally. So you could see in one year the transition I made from all that fashion stuff into wearing bell-bottom jeans and turtleneck t-shirts that were bought at the local Army-Navy store. What should have been an <clears throat> idyllic experience for this very young, talented faculty body was actually a time fraught with fear and anxiety. Young men. Our boyfriends, our brothers, our cousins, our neighbors were being pursued relentlessly by their local draft boards to enlist for military service. Too many of these young in innocents, 52,000 of them to be exact, were sent off to war and returned home in caskets. Young women were exempt from military service because of their female sex, although numbers of brave young women did enlist in the military to serve their country in supporting roles as military administration or in the field as nurses. This particular poster was an outcry against the brutal slaughter of war. On March 16, 1968, 
U.S. Army forces massacred up to 504 unarmed South Vietnamese civilians, mostly women and children, in the village of Mai Lai. As a stark contrast to this volatile political atmosphere played out daily on the nightly news in my country, my undergraduate years as a graphic design major focused on learning reductive modernist formal vocabularies ideally suited to the needs of corporate business and advertising environments. My parents had anticipated I would return home after college to work, in a, work as a creative in one of the many New York City advertising agencies. That plan was altered when on the verge of my college graduation in May 1970, the national tragedy at Kent State University happened. On May 4th, 1970, Ohio National Guardsmen marched onto the campus of Kent State University and fired their weapons into a crowd of unarmed students who were gathered to protest the U.S. incursions into Cambodia as a military strategy of the Vietnam War. Thirteen students were shot, four students were killed, and nine survived. There was a significant national response to the shootings. Hundreds of universities, colleges, and high schools closed down throughout the United States as four million students went on strike. Art students, including myself, poured into the printmaking studios and letterpress labs to produce a multitude of anti-war visual propaganda, closely mirroring the activity of the Atelier Populaire during the Paris students' riots of May 1968. At the RISD workshops, we created posters for the immediate protest march on the state capitol building in Providence, and five days later, we sent these same materials and more on buses to Washington, D.C., where over 100,000 youthful demonstrators converged to protest the shootings and the continuing war. Uh, right up front, the, those are my classmates. <coughs> Caught up in the vortex of this momentum event, I became aware for the very first time in my life how my skills could be better put to use for purposes beyond the promotion or the selling of goods and services, a revelation toward a new way of thinking about design. Much of the graphic design work I admired from this time period were the anti-war posters. The poster on the left was widely distributed during the Vietnam era. The poster on the right by Tommy Unger is a potent graphic commentary criticizing the US government for its aggression in Vietnam. But you have to make a living, right? So thanks to a recruiting session I attended at RISD in the spring of 1970, I was offered a job at Hallmark Cards in Kansas City, Missouri in the creative lettering, lettering department. Although I only lasted seven months in that very strict corporate environment in the very conservative Midwest, I made good, use, good future use of the lettering skill set I acquired at Hallmark. All of this is drawn with a pencil and either a brush or what we would call a rapidograph or a technical pen. This is all hand lettered. No computers during that time. I returned to New York City and took a job as an assistant at a two-person design studio, primarily serving the book publishing market. At the studio, I made many, many book covers, often utilizing my illustrative lettering skills. And that is also me in the photograph being a liberated woman. In the summer of 1972, I wanted to escape New York City, so I accepted a job as a crafts counselor at the Shaker Village Work Group, which was a teenage summer program, primarily for students from uh, the New York City area, 
that occupy historic Shaker land and buildings in New, Le New Lebanon, New York. I met my future husband that summer. Victor was hired to teach teenagers folk, uh, Shaker folk songs, so my husband is a musician. And I was hired to teach um, these young teens. I had an interest in weaving and had done some weaving at college. And um, they had 150-year-old Shaker looms that are now actually behind glass in museums. But the, I taught the teens how to weave guitar straps and pocketbooks and little things like that on a 150-year-old Shaker loom. So that was quite interesting, I have to say. After the summer, I followed Victor to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he lived commune style with other like-minded musicians. I joined the group as their designated graphic designer, and that's actually what I look like in my hippy-dippy face. During that time, I built up my freelance business working for the Animal Rescue League of Boston, their shelter. And I did all sorts of um, space ads that would be in newspapers and magazines that were primarily to encourage people to come to the shelter and adopt animals. Primarily dogs and cats, but they also had things like rabbits and all sorts of little creatures, and horses. So we have a kind of horse culture there. I also did ads and other promotions for this convenience store that was called Store 24, and it was called Store 24 because it was a 24-hour convenience store. It was open 24 hours, and it served the counterculture crowd so that when you had the munchies after smoking dope at three o'clock in the morning, you can go and buy your sugar there. So I got to do all sorts of kind of fun, youthful things with those ads. In the fall of 1977, I was hired by Seba Corning Diagnostics Corporation as a senior consultant designer, working directly with Robert Potts, who was then the head of design worldwide. I worked for Seba Corning for 20 years, designing all manner of packaging and marketing materials. So this is just a little tiny sampling of the kind of work I did. I always balanced corporate work with nonprofit work. Also at, at this, in the fall of 77, so there, there were two momentous things that happened to me in the fall of 77. I began working for Seba Corning, which was, such, which was a steady job as a consultant, which meant I worked in my own studio. And I also was hired to teach in 1977. I had a permanent half-time faculty position at the college I, I am now at, which, which was called Massachusetts College of Art. The and design was added later. 22 years later, in the fall of 1999, I transitioned into a full-time design educator. In 2001, I became the chair of the program, and in 2007, I was a full tenured professor. And, um, you know, what was so important during this time period uh, is, is the people that you work with, because essentially, it is the faculty, at least in my uh, university, that determines the course of the curriculum. And this was, there were actually seven of us, and, and it, when this picture was taken in Chicago, we were um, going to a conference, and a design education conference, and the person that is second on the left is my colleague Jan Kubashevitz from Poland, who was a mentee of um, Christoph Lang. Um, so we wrote the curricular and we really built up the program together. As a component to my service to the Boston design community, I served on the AIGA Boston <coughs> Chapter Board. AIGA stands for American Institute of Graphic Arts, and it is essentially the, gra the, the national graphic designers organization in the US. There's currently something like 70 chapters all around, because you know the US is big, all around the, in the major cities in the US. And Boston happens to be, I think, the fifth largest. So it, it's an important chapter, and it's a very active chapter. And for many, many years, I organized many uh, lecture events um, and exhibition events for um, a host of uh, well-known designers and design educators. Besides, besides designing announcement posters and invitations for exhibitions, I also was invited to participate 
in AIGA's 100th exhibition, and here they were celebrating their centennial event, very much like what's going on here with the Centennial for Independence. Um, AIGA was founded in 1914, so in 2014, they were celebrating their 100th birthday. And one of the projects that they did that I was asked to participate in was they, they asked 100 designers to choose a year, it was kind of a lottery because you could only have one designer for one year, a lottery um, to pick a year and to create a homage for that year. And they all had to be eight by eight, if you will, and they were all exhibited at the big gala. And when I had this opportunity to do this, I chose the year 1953, which had, for me, great meaning. Because in 1953 uh, was the celebration of the coronation of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. One of my earliest childhood memories, and I was quite small at this time, was watching the coronation on black and white television. It was the first coronation ever televised. And one other thing was, because my mother had told me I was named after Princess Elizabeth, who is now Queen Elizabeth, so there was great meaning that, for me on that. And it's a homage to British uh, postage, if you've seen British postage. Uh, from 2001 to 2003, I was the art director for the New England, uh, Art New England magazine. Um, and over that time period of three years, because it came out every other month, I designed 18 covers. It was great fun to do this. And also all of the uh, interiors, or what we would call the edu um, editorial well. The, and this is an example of the kind of uh, layout that I would do. But also, I would sometimes be challenged with some of the materials I was given. But this, this actually was a big win, and it's still one of my favorite pieces of design that, that I did. Um, the article, which was only one spread, was comparing what was at that time the big dig in Boston. They dug up large parts of Boston because they dug a second tunnel that went under the Charles River and went to our airport. We needed another way to get to the airport because it's on the other side of Boston. And, so they dug up half of Boston for like 10 years in order to do this. And this article was comparing the big dig in Boston with the, with the big dig in Berlin after the wall came down. The photos that accompanied the article were completely an awful, boring pictures of bulldozers digging holes. So I had this idea that maybe I could get out from under using those ugly pictures and I managed to convince the managing editor of the magazine to run with a large white hole in the middle as the center image for the feature. So I've always you know, appreciated being able to get away with that. I've always loved photography. Uh, Mass Art was very fortunate to have on campus one of four 20 by 24 Polaroid cameras that exist in the world. And I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of the, these cameras, but they're like a huge medicine cabinet because it's, as you know, with Polaroid, it's one-on-one, -on -one, right? So the thing, the, the camera itself is like this big because the film that's in it is this big. Um, they're very large, as you can see. And uh, we were very fortunate. Um, Edward Land, who invented Polaroid, invented Polaroid in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So that was the world headquarters for Polaroid, and they were often very supportive of the art community in Boston. And so of the four cameras that were available, one was at Mass Art, one was leased to a very well-known portrait photographer by the name of Elsa Dorfman, one was sent to New York City and, and used in New York City, and I think another one was in Germany, as I recall. And they, that's all that existed in the world. So if you wanted to work with those cameras, you had to go to the particular site, and I was very fortunate to be able to work with it, and also to have my students work with this camera. 
And as I mentioned to you, another 20 by 24 camera was leased to Elsa Dorfman, who was a Cambridge-based photographer who used to do it, who used to do family portraits. So pictured here are my two children who are now adults. Alana, who is on my hip, is 31, and Alex is 35, and that is my husband, Victor. That's in uh, 1987. I've also kept active in the international poster arena, having posters accepted into the Mexican, Bolivia, and Warsaw Biennales. Um, on the left, the Mandela Poster Project was uh, created by South African designers to celebrate uh, Nelson Mandela's 95th birthday. Unfortunately, he died just a few days actually before his 95th birthday, but the exhibition was up. And um, basically it was set as a competition to select the best 95 posters that were submitted from 700 posters that were received from all over the world. And I was really quite honored to have uh, my poster design accepted into the initial 95. It was also, I also sent it to the Mexican Biennale and um, that's what it looked like in Mexico. <clears throat> These two posters, one on the left, was an invitational to celebrate the International Red Cross and the one on the right was um, an invitational for a, 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 an exhibition called AIDS Stop uh, to bring awareness of the AIDS crisis around the world. They were both created in 2013 and I love to tell the story that that hand is actually my 12 year old son Alex's hand because he has very long artistic fingers, because he's an artist. And um, he, he thought he had broke his finger, and we went to the doctor and they did an x-ray, and they, do it in, in, they weren't doing it in computers in those days. It was actual film, and I managed to get the film, which was great, so I could get his x-ray and use his hand. Uh, <clears throat> some of you have seen this poster already. Um, this one uh, was the stop driving poster, and this particular one was accepted into the Wausau Poster Biennale in 2014. Now, isn't this interesting? This is the problem with these projectors. This is the same poster, and actually it looks more, that's more realistic, and it's so washed out here. This is the thing that drives me nuts. But anyway, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go ahead. So, uh, biodiver okay, listen, biodiversity was one of the themes of the, uh, the Mexican Biennale in 2016. And so, as part of one of the themes, we're working on one of the themes for the Mexican Poster Biennale. And so, it's a combination of both student work and professional work. And students do quite well in it. Okay. Um, I, I'll get through this quickly. I, I just I realized how many posters I've been making lately. So this, the immigrant experience was the invitational for Posters Without Borders and was also um, exhibited in Morelia, Mexico, which was another one of the Mexican Biennales in 2014. And some of you are going to recognize Marchetta, who was there with me as well. Yeah, yeah right? You know her, right? Yeah. Um, the poster on the left was created for an invitational exhibition titled Questioning the Bomb on the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which in this exhibition was held at the University of Maryland in 2015. I think, you know, I showed my group the uh, Burning Butterfly, so that's another one of these posters that is done for this annual remembrance of this horrific act. This poster, okay. My concept here was to visually illustrate the poignant story of Sadeko Sasaki, who believed that if she could fold 1,000 paper cranes, she would be cured of the leukemia that resulted from her exposure to atomic radiation at age two. She died before she could complete them. Do you remember this? Did you, did you hear this story as children? 
because it, it, we have it in the US. It's a children's book. The poster, um, so my son was very taken with this story when I read it to him as a child. Uh, my, my, my son is a very sensitive soul and, and it, it made him cry. So what my son did is he folded 1,000 cranes in honor of this story. It took him about a year and they're still in the closet in a big garbage bag but it was really important for him to complete this in her honor. So um, when I was asked her to produce a poster for this invitational, I thought of Alex and I thought of this story and I based it on that. The second poster, which is not so pink, trust me, it's not so pink, <laughs> is, um, was just accepted at the tri International Triennial of the Fourth Block in Ukraine, which is happening in April. I was invited to contribute to an exhibition sponsored by the Bolivian Poster Biennale that honored the life of Umberto Eco. My concept here was to visualize that there is always a center, even if we are not able to perceive it. What is the fixed point that holds the pendulum of the imagination, combines the past with the unexplored future? What is it that moves us? And, and that was the brief, and this was my graphic response to it. And, and I'll just go very briefly, two more posters. One was based on the 50th anniversary of Che Guevara, and it was exhibited in Mexico. And this particular tolerance poster, which I did for Mirko Illich for his big project on tolerance, um, is actually um, being exhibited around the world. And he sent me, actually this morning, uh, pictures of this in a billboard in <coughs> Slovenia. <coughs> So um, he's really also an amazing agent of social change. And the last one, um, this one was actually a great honor. I was um, asked to be one of 10 designers invited to participate in a poster exhibition on the US Constitution, and this was in September, last September. Each designer was assigned one of 10 amendments to the Consti our Constitution, which is also known as the Bill of Rights. I was assigned Amendment 9, and Amendment 9 reads, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Simply stated, this amendment covers and protects rights not specifically already mentioned in the Constitution, like the freedom of press, freedom of religion, freedom to, to have a gun, and other things. So essentially, you cannot deny people their rights, telling them they have no rights. So that was my play on words. I wasn't able to attend the opening, but um, a lot of um, images were sent, the posters in the corner, as they were introducing the project at, I think it was Cooper Union. OK, so. <clears throat> Um, wait a minute. When I trained in graphic design at RISD in the 1960s, designers were essentially the servants of business. Designers were given assignments where the context and the content were fixed, the copy was written, and the designer was challenged to give it a form and nothing more. In the mid to late 1970s, I began writing design curriculum that mirrored my interest in advocacy and design authorship. Early in the 1980s, I was given the opportunity to publish my Introduction to Graphic Design course curriculum in the form of a 10 chapter book. Each chapter was an actual assignment. And here you can see just two of them. This was chapter three. Um, and, and this is uh, playing with the idea of letter form progression, starting with the letter form, and by uh, equal steps, turning it into something else. And then this is chapter nine, which I'm gonna talk more about, and this was called the Vegetable Poster. Now, I think it's really important to understand this is, um, well, you see, 79 and 82. There's no computers. 
So all of the work, this is student work, all of the work you're seeing is either cut paper and hand-painted gouache. So assignment nine was called the vegetable poster. The goal of this assignment is to encourage children ages nine, six to nine to eat more vegetables. Having raised two children, I know how hard it is to get them to eat their vegetables. So, all, oh, sorry, I mentioned, so the, uh, the examples are all hand letters. So in this one, you know, this is great fun, you know, to, to get a kid to, you know, think about carrots in a different way other than those things that, that they put on the plate. And here, you know, how many kids are going to eat asparagus stalks? I don't think so. But here, you know, this uh, one of my students turns it into like castles and makes it fantastical and possibly fun to wrap your head around. And even though I don't see children eating hot chili peppers, I mean, the, the power of this particular poster and the sense of humor of sunbathing hot chili peppers is quite wonderful. I love when these kinds of things happen. These are, by the way, all second year students. Assignment 10 was called the country poster. The challenge here was to have students choose a country and interpret the feeling, design, and color of that country graphically. Interestingly enough, I did this assignment with Malcolm Greer at RISD. The only copy to appear on the poster is the name of the country that should be integrated into the larger composition. On the left, the country name you can see woven into the basket is Haiti. And on the right, um, you can see that the, the camels crossing the Sahara Desert spell out Morocco. So these are truly excellent examples of word and image integration. Ah, and you will probably know who this person is on the left. So something happened when I started giving this assignment. And I didn't direct it at all. It just naturally happened. And then I went, oh, I like this a lot. And now it's only political. But the students took the opportunity of making political statements. On the left is a masterful cut paper portrait of labor activist Lech Walesa. I didn't mispronounce his name. Poland solidarity leader who worked to free Poland from communist rule in the 1970s and 80s. And you can see the word, instead of solidarity here, we have the word Poland. And um, on, the on the right, um, this was done, as you can see, in 1980, and, the, and that's Khomeini. And he was in Paris at the time of the civil war in Iran that deposed the Shah of Iran. Where these things came from, from these young students, I can't tell you, but they kept coming. And I really loved it. Um, the poster on the left is a dramatic visual d demonstration of apartheid in the, in the Republic of South Africa. And on the right is the student's advocacy for the unification, <laughs> if you look at the year, you just roll your eyes, of Israel and Palestine, which did not happen. In 1903, I published my second book, a collection of 42 graphic design and typography assignments written by college educators to teach the fundamental design concepts and techniques and richly illustrated with actual student work. So, one of the assignments that um, I included in this particular book, so you know, there were a, um, a batch of my assignments, but then there were also uh, a lot from my colleagues. One assignment was titled Human Rights Advocacy Poster. Students were given a copy of the United Nations 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights document and were asked to choose one of the rights to visualize in the form of a poster. Here my student, Rita Ferrara, chooses right 16 to comment on illegal immigration, and this right reads, all people deserve the right to peaceably obtain basic human necessities in time of dire need, including food, water, and basic shelter, even if it violates the law. Now, Students make these choices when I give them in, in the assignment. They can choose anyone they want. Rita, at that time, was an illegal alien. 
and she gravitated directly to that her family had come from Portugal and they were living underneath the line. Um, there, luckily now, they, she is an American citizen, um, but she knows exactly how, what that feels like. And I really appreciate when students choose subject matter where they have a personal interest in or it has great meaning to them. Um, on the left is also another one that visualizes right 16 and really focuses on the whole idea of homelessness. And on the right, on the left, and on the right is right three. And right three reads, all people deserve the right to be free from persecution or discrimination based on any physical feature or quality, including race, gender, disability, age, sexual orientation, of which this one takes on, or any other physical feature or aspect. I think you can see easily there are two E's in the Garden of Eden. Another assignment I give to my students is titled Designing Descent, the Advocacy Poster Series. So it's one thing to design a magnificent poster, and it's another thing to design three magnificent posters all in a series, which is a great challenge. The students here research a topic or issue, determine an appropriate conceptual direction, and produce three posters in which could be an ongoing series to inform, empower, and educate a targeted consti constituency that would benefit most by its message. So here we have uh, uh, Colleen, and she is encouraging women to check their breasts, and she is using humor to do that. So check them, handle them, and squeeze them. And this particular poster series was designed for placement in our subway, on our, in our transportation system in Boston, which would include our, tra we have trams, trams, buses, and subway cars. Here, Erica Sullivan engages parents to remind them that they play a significant role in their child's journey through reading. These posters would be displayed in schools and libraries. And I think what's really important, if you look, there is a parent in the background in each one of these journeys that the children are taking along with their parent by reading with them. The most important thing a parent can do is read, with, not to their, but with their child um, and participate in their learning how to read. And then Jesse Tubero targets young teenagers using comic book heroes that advocate the use of condoms in saving lives. So I don't know if you can see it because it's getting very washed out, but in the hand of each superhero is a condom. These posters would be seen in teen community centers and in high schools and middle schools. My third book, uh, which is titled Developing Citizen Designers, was published in 2016. It responds to the rise in academic debate and teaching in the areas of social design, sustainable design, ethical design, and design futures. Educating young designers today doesn't mean teaching them to become consummate service providers, as I was trained. Students want to use their skills for good. They want to develop the tools they need to respond to unforeseen challenges, and they want to give back to their world. But how do we teach our students to be effective at making social change? So just to give you a very brief overview of this book, um, in the table of contents, the book is divided into three parts. The part one, um, basically how this book is set up, is there's an introduction essay in each one of the sections. Then there is a five-part question with usually a professional or a design educator and how they use social design methods in their practice. And then there's a whole list of case studies that were written by uh, international design educators who have found ways to bring social design pedagogy within their classroom environment as they're teaching their students visual language skill sets. 
And so part one is about design thinking, which is socially responsible design, design activism, and uh, design authorship. And then under design methodology, um, there's things like collaborative learning, these are methods, uh, participatory design, and the third one is service design. So this is kind of how I broke up this particular book. Now, um, of the 42 assignments, I'm, I'm only going to take you through one of them. It's the one that I wrote. It's mine, and it's the only one that I put in the book. And God, you can't see that at all. How much fun is that? But anyway, let me just tell you what this was. So, um, the family van is a mobile health clinic. You know, those big, huge vans that are in the street. And this is a program initiative of the Harvard Medical School. The Harvard Medical School is like two blocks away from Mass Art. And the van travels to underserved Boston neighborhoods each week providing free preventative health services and health education. Now, Boston is a multicultural city and it is made up of many, many different cultures and ethnicities. Some who have been in Boston for many, many years and speak English, or many, many cultures who have been born in Boston and they considered themselves American, whether they're Chinese American, Japanese American, um, Cambodian American, it goes on and on and on, Italian American, Irish American. Um, but then there we have a big influx of immigrants uh, who don't necessarily speak our language yet, and um, they really live in parts of the city that are low income because they're just trying to get a start. And many of them, like I said, do not speak English. And they're scared to death to go anywhere, as they should in the US, because chances are they're going to get deported, which is a whole other <coughs> terrible thing that's happening. But anyway, I won't editorialize on that. So Jennifer Bennett, who was the family van director, contacted the Center for Art and Community Partnerships which is the which whose mission is to match the mass art community with neighborhood organizations to create mutually beneficial sustainable partnerships in art and design so we're really fortunate to have this conduit to help us connect with partners that we can use that we can bring right into the classroom so for four weeks, starting in early September through early October in 2012, which is when I did this, the challenge for my 14, thir they were third years, third year students, was to reimagine the existing visual exterior of the family van, I'm gonna show it to you in a minute, that was considered very off-putting to the very communities that the van served. In other words, they were scared to death to go into it. On the first day, Jennifer Bennett came and she gave a presentation to my class. Okay, so this is Jennifer Bennett. That's the thing. Would you go into that thing? I don't think so. <laughs> that scares the bejesus out of me, much less somebody who doesn't speak English. And, you know, they would think they go in there and they never come out again. And, <laughs> right? And it's meant to be to give them free health services. So they had a problem. Um, which is a wonderful problem. So Jennifer, and so the deal is Jennifer Bennett had to come to my class every single week. First, in the first class, she presented to my class and she told me, you can't read that at all, but it says, uh, why medical, why mobile health clinics? So she explained the whole concept of why mobile health clinics exist and, and what, what uh, their mission is. And then um, the students started to do work. And that's Jennifer in the corner. Because the deal was, there were two of us in the classroom. I'm there to teach my students visual language strategies and to make their work stronger and speak. And Jennifer is there to tell them whether they're hitting the right constituencies. Because the students may not be of those particular communities that need this kind of service. And that's the biggest thing in social design, is that it's great for us to want to go in and help underserved neighborhoods in however we possibly can. But if we don't understand what the community really needs, and if we don't have representatives from that community, helping us so that we hit our targets, then it's, it's, it, it's colonialism.
It's neo-colonialism, and it's at its worst. So um, these assignments that are in my book strive to try to do this. Okay, so then there were, there were 14 students in the class, and um, they presented their final results again to Jennifer in the fourth week. So the 14 design proposals were then taken by Jennifer back to the family van staff office to be shared with the community stakeholders. Five, as you can see them all terrifically washed out, five of the 14 van wraps were selected to undergo community testing. The ultimate goal was to have the local community residents, in particular, they wanted the teenagers, they wanted them to get in there to protect them early. They wanted them to select the new van wrap. So they took these things around to all the five neighborhoods that the van serves. They went into the high school, and you can see with the little sticky note things, they wanted them to vote on them. They wanted to get an idea of which of the ones the, the young people and the old people um, of these communities would respond to. So um, when all was said and done and all the, the results were tallied, my student Millie Husava's uh, visual proposal, which incorporated vivid colors and imaginative imagery, was favored as the best rep representation of the va family van's mission and I quote, their mission is to increase access to health and improve healthy behaviors by providing culturally and linguistically appropriate health services to the community in which it serves. Now I know you can't read it and I apologize, but here it is. This was her initial idea and what she basically did was she took things like free health services and those and the vocabulary words like free screening and free health and she translated it into several of the languages of the immigrants that, that this van served. And then when Millie actually worked with the family van team, um, you can, if you can see that they had her work and take a few things out and um, uh, take some, you know, make it a little bit clearer. And they also worked with her to make sure that the translations were correct. I think this is going to show you what it looks like. Still, the color is really off on this. But um, that's what the van, that's how big that thing is. And I've been in the street, um, because my school is one of the underserved neighborhoods of the van, I've been in the street when that thing comes down the block. And you can't not notice it. And it's a lot, if you can think of what was before, it's a lot friendlier. And um, it's really made a difference in um, their mission and being able to meet their mission. Okay, so the other part of my life is to create exhibitions that inspire my students. And I wanna just talk about this quote because it's a really important quote and we need to really think about it. And this is by Tibor Kalman who was a provocateur. A good history of design isn't a history of design at all. It's a history of ideas and therefore culture. So um, basically, graphic design history is really or should be about how we have come to know what we believe in design, what we have learned about known practitioners, their practices, their relation to their work, but even more so how their artifacts fit into the larger cultural context. That's very important. So and this is a long list and it's only here just to show you I've done seven comprehensive large design exhibitions. The first three, when I was first kind of um, getting my feet wet in this kind of a way of communicating, two of them celebrate human beings. I'm not gonna ever do that again. They're males. And then, this, uh, then, then there was another one that celebrated a particular period in time, and that was Dutch graphic design between the wars. And you know, I really learned a lot. The best way to do research um, that isn't client-driven is to decide what it is you want to learn, and then create a project that enables you to do this research, and then have some physical manifestation of it so that you can share it with others. But if you notice, the last four are actually more closer to my heart 
because all four of them are socio-political poster exhibitions, all with a specific theme. So the first one in 2005 is called The Graphic Imperative, and that looked at, um, the, it started with the time period. Remember I said in my presentation I was most influenced by the socio-political work of the 1960s when I was studying design. So it starts at that time period in 1965, and it goes for 40 years. So it's 40 years of socio-political design. The second one um, I did on AIDS. And what was most amazing about this particular exhibition, which I was able to curate from a large archive and then add posters to it, was that this particular AIDS archive came from a person who had wanderlust. And he would, in order to fund his travels all over the world, he would go into villages and small cities. He would go all over the world and he would collect posters. And he would collect, interestingly enough, AIDS posters with very specific visual languages. Because in order to tell somebody in Uganda about how you get AIDS, you do not use Western visual vocabularies. They will know the message is not for them. So you have to use the messages that they know is meant for them. So that was what that was about. You'll see some of these things. And then the next one I did was graphic advocacy. And this was about when the poster migrates to the internet. The poster is just as significant as it ever was but the dissemination of the poster has expanded. So the poster is not dead, and it has a very long life. And then uh, most many of you are familiar with my latest one, which is why I'm standing here today, and that's the Women's Rights Exhibition, which was um, shown initially in Poland last year in the, Polish, in the Poster Museum, and is now in the Galicia Jewish Museum in Krakow. So just to go through this really quickly, these are a couple of, um, all of these exhibitions had many venues. They traveled all over, which was fabulous. So this is what Graphic Imperative looked like within its uh, in installation at the Philadelphia University in 2006. And it gives you an idea of the power of, of these messages. Every exhibition that I do has to have a print catalog. They all have websites, but here's the deal with websites, and they're all current websites, by the way, because I keep paying for them. But the minute you stop paying for the website, it goes away. So you have to, in order, if you want to have a memory of it, you have to also do print. Print is not going out of style. You need both print and interactive. So this is the cover and back cover of Graphic Imperative and um, some of the materials that are in it, some of the posters. All of my catalogs are A4 landscapes, so they're all consistent. And it's such a great format for posters. You get four decent sized posters on these things. The, this is graphic intervention. This is one of the in, uh, installations in York University, which is also outside of Philadelphia. It gives you an idea of what it looked like. Um, for these AIDS-related exhibitions. And this is graphic intervention at my college, at Massachusetts College of Art during the opening. Every single um, installation is different because every room is different and so the curators have to work with this. And this is um, graphic intervention at the Art Directors Club in New York City. That's my venue in New York City. And at the opening of um, graphic advocacy, oh, graphic, uh, at this one, I think. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I get them all mixed up. Okay, so this is the catalog cover. Some, now, this is what's so amazing about these posters, and I'll just give you a quick example. There were 150 of them. So, Parisia lives in Tehran, Iran. And in her culture, you cannot show a body part, a face, a anything. So how do you tell your constituency about how you could possibly contract AIDS? So here she has two posters where you know she is suggesting that you know when you have sexual intercourse 
or whether you are going to get pregnant, that you have to, that you do have to get tested for AIDS. And then here, you know, this is doom and gloom and scariness. Um, this is another, I can't remember, this is Turkey or um, one of the Arab countries. And uh, this is Turkey, which has more Western vocabularies. Ah, and this is the Aboriginal community in Australia. They have a very mystical language and a way in which they talk directly to their communities. And this one, they're very, they're dying up here, trust me, but they're very intricate, gorgeous paintings um, of the myths that talk about education for AIDS, about how to prevent AIDS, again, using their myths, their dreaming myths, and once someone is sick, caring for them. So, um, yes, that's probably my favorite one. And one of the greatest things about these traveling exhibitions, at least from my point of view, is that I get to meet with students, I get to do these kinds of lectures all over, but even better when I get to, to meet with students in small groups in the gallery itself, and we talk about the work, and we talk about how they feel about the work. Um, this was graphic advocacy. This is when the, the, this is the kind of uh, funny part about this. So it's really about the poster in the digital age, and the poster being disseminated. And in all the gallery institutions, there was a computer, and you could see the work online. Yes, you could, but still you had to print them out. Um, and so a lot of this has to do with the environment, uh, with some of the. Um, uh, political upheavals we've had, with some of the devastating earthquakes and tsunamis that we've had, um, and so uh, anyway, so this was this one was at the Art Directors Club, and it was at the opening of this exhibition. This is the opening of this exhibition, and you possibly might rec no, maybe you can't in the corner. That's Stephen Heller at the microphone, and he was moderating a panel. Um, where, I, where I was talking about the work, that's me in the front with the white hair, but right next to me is Milton Glaser. And the two of us were talking about how important it is that, that designers use their skill set to have a voice in the world in which they live. It was very well attended. It was kind of fun. This is the cover of Graphic Advocacy and um, some of the interior of them. This one, this particular spread had to do with the dev devastating flood we had in New Orleans. I don't know if you had heard about that, but pretty much the city went, was underwater and it had devastating consequences and some of the amazing graphic languages that come out to advocate. Well, clearly this is condemnation of our then President Bush, who deserved it. And so all of them have um, websites, and uh, this is a, a student in another school who was holding three of my catalogs. So d these are very important for me. I learn a lot from them. And um, now women's rights, this is what it looked like in the small gallery that I have at my college. It opened in September of 2006. Um, and it travels because it's all digital and it can be printed on site, which is really fabulous. And this is its installation in Seoul, South Korea in December of 2016. And this was the best moment. This was at the Mexican Poster Biennale in 2016. And I've, oh, I've had all of my exhibitions shown in the Mexican Poster Biennale every other year. I have a new exhibition and they invite me to show it. But this time I got off the plane and the director of the Biennale said, Liz, I did something unusual and I hope you're not upset. And I'm going, uh-oh, here it comes. What did he do? He didn't put it up, you know, because they usually have like about 10 to 15 exhibitions during these Biennales. He said, Liz, I put it on the streets where it belongs. And so here are some street signs. You see how it was strung? <coughs> it was strung all the way down the block into the main square. So that people on the street, a lot of these people don't go into galleries. 
The people who need to see these things don't go into galleries. And so that was really such a great aha moment. I really would like to see more of my exhibitions put out into the street where they belong. Um, this was the catalog cover and how um, I used the poster, man, how I used the catalog. Um, how many of you saw this last year? I know a few, good, 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 good. You don't have to go to crack hour, good. <laughs> It's a larger exhibition. It was a larger exhibition in Warsaw. And some of you will recognize this. <laughs> I recognize the person who's staring back at us so menacingly. <laughs> and the opening, which was completely fabulous. I loved every moment of it. And of course, Martin's <clears throat> amazing graphic design. OK, last thing. So um, the invaluable experience that I have gained working on these exhibition projects has continued to affirm my belief that graphic design is an important artistic and cultural form that should be made accessible to students, our professional communities, and the public who would all benefit by exposure to all forms of creative expression. And for myself, providing students with the opportunity to experience making meaningful and positive contributions to society through their creative power empowers them to play a more active role in improving the way they live, interact, and communicate with each other. As I was profoundly influenced and inspired by the times in which I came of age, I am ever so hopeful that these experiences will have a profound and meaningful effect on our students today and in the future. Thank you. <laughs>